So this is my first webinar ever, so everyone bear with me. I'll try not to talk too fast because I tend to do that when I'm on my own. Um, so submersion injuries, drowning and near drowning. Um, I felt like this was kind of an important topic. I know in MRA we're mostly focused on mountain rescue, but there are lots of organizations that dabble in a lot of different things just aside from our technical rescue. I know on our own search and rescue team here in Utah County, we're also involved with some open water and swift water rescue. And we're getting into that time of year when we're going to be seeing these kinds of accidents and injuries. Um, and so I think just helpful to kind of go through and review. So submersion accidents, just a good overview. According to the CDC, about 10 people die every day from unintentional drowning. Out of those, typically about two are children ages 14 and younger. Um, it ranks fifth among the leading causes of death due to unintentional injury in the United States alone and worldwide continues to be about the second leading cause of accidental death. That's a big deal, and I think probably one of the saddest components of submersion accidents is that there are largely a preventable death and injury. When we talk about submersion, I think it's really important to kind of understand the definition. Uh, you'll hear a lot of different terms that float around out there, drowning, near drowning, wet and dry drowning, salt water versus fresh water. In the past, drowning was divided into subcategories. Um, that included those that I outlined above, but over the years there's been a lot of research done um, and in an effort to be more uniform in the research realm and to cause less confusion among our clinicians and lay people, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation recommended that we avoid using all the various subcategories and just stick to the terminology submersion, accidents, or injuries um, rather than using the near drowning and wet and dry, etc. So when we talk about submersion injuries, basically refers to any incident involved, um, involving submersion into water that leads to possible aspiration and asphyxia. Submersion injuries don't include diving-related accidents or those caused by elements in the water like marine life, et cetera. I do, however, think it's kind of important to go through some of these other definitions because unfortunately while uh, we've tried to move away from the terminology, you'll find these terms floating out there. If you get online and Google anything about drowning, you'll find several sites that pop up with these different terms. You'll still see it in the media quite prevalently. And so I think it's important um, in our position to be able to know what people are talking about and what they're referring to. When we go through these definitions, they talk about drowning. Drowning um, entails death due to submersion in the water. Near drowning, is when someone has an incident where they're submerged in the water, but they have survival for at least 24 hours after that event. A wet drowning refers to aspiration or inhaling water into the lungs that ultimately leads to death, or dry drowning, which is death due to asphyxiation. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but basically they get some spasming in the airways. It closes those airways off so they can't breathe, so no water gets into the lungs. Um, they basically kind of uh, just asphyxiate uh, themselves. So another terminology uh, that you'll hear kind of out there is salt water versus fresh water. And there's lots of theoretical ideas about drowning in salt water or fresh water and how it can affect you, how it affects the lungs differently. Uh, there's some ideas that uh, based on the different content of the water that it can lead to electrolyte changes in the body. Uh, basically, though, um, when push comes to shove, the bottom line of it all is that clinically there's very little difference between people who drown in salt water versus fresh water. It's really more about the amount of water that they take in drowning, that they inhale or not. Um, and typically, if you're going to see any changes, differences in electrolytes, you'd have to consume copious amounts of either the salt water or fresh water to really affect that. And at that point, most people die anyway, so the point becomes kind of moot there. So understanding the problem a little bit better, according to the CDC, from about 2005 to 2009, there were an average of approximately 3,500 fatal unintentioning, unintentional drownings in the United States. These were non-boating related. An additional about 350 people die each year from drowning in boating-related accidents. 
One in five of those who die from drowning are children under the age of 14. For every child who dies from drowning, about another five end up in the ER uh, for care for non-fatal injuries related to submersion. Um, more than 50% of our drowning victims need to be treated in the ER and require either hospitalization or transfer for further care. And these non-fatal drownings become really important because there's kind of three outcomes when it comes to drowning. Either you drown and you die, you drown and you survive and have no deficits or problems thereafter, or you drown and you survive but you have severe neurological deficits, uh, i.e. like brain injury. These non-fatal drownings can be associated with severe brain damage that can result in long-term disabilities that include memory problems, learning disabilities, and permanent loss of basic functions. Um, and I think this is really important because then as we look at that, we're looking long-term, there are lots of costs associated with people who drown but maybe survive these incidents that have major deficits going forward. So this isn't always only an issue of just loss of life, but also medically looking at the cost of the United States on an annual basis. Um, I had been reading, and I believe on the CDC, they estimate uh, somewhere around $600 million, uh, million dollars a year or so spent on uh, cost for continued care for these individuals. So who is most at risk for drowning? Children are a big factor in this, specifically children in the age range of one to four considered high at the highest risk for drowning and uh, responsible for most of the deaths. Um, about 80% of those who drown are also male. This may be some of that male machismo type attitude. It's kind of the adolescent and young adult group um, that we see a lot of males who get into trouble, and then minorities also. Uh, African Americans seem to have a higher rate of fatal drowning incidents than, than Caucasians. So this disparity is greatest in swimming pools. This may come down to a matter of just swim lessons and training. Um, there's not a lot of great information as to why that exists, uh, but, but it is there and known in the literature. Other risk factors that affect why someone may drown. Uh, lack of close supervision is a big one. Drowning can happen really quickly and quietly anywhere where there's water. So that means bathtubs, swimming pools, buckets, even in the presence of lifeguards. So especially these little kids that we're talking about, when they're not being watched closely, they're at big risk. Lack of barriers. Barriers meaning like fences around pools, locked gates, etc. These help to prevent young kids from getting access to water areas without adult supervision and can be a big factor in drowning. Location is another one that comes into play. Kids in that age range of one to four, usually drowning in swimming pools or bathtubs at home, but that older group typically are drowning in more natural settings, uh, meaning rivers, lakes, um, ocean, etc. More than half of all fatal and non-fatal drowning accidents in the age range of 15 and older occur in these natural water settings. Next is failure to wear a life jacket. It's a big lifesaver. In 2010, the United States Coast Guard received reports for 4,600 boating incidents. Of those, about 3,100 of the boaters were reported injured, and out of that group, 672 people died. Most of those boating deaths 72% were caused by drowning, and out of that sounds a lot of numbers here, 88% of those people weren't wearing life jackets, meaning most likely had they been wearing life jackets, they would not have drowned. Um, alcohol use is another big factor, particularly in the adolescent and young adult population. It's involved in up to about 70% of deaths associated with with water recreation. Almost a quarter of all ER visits for drowning, about one in five, uh, it accounts for, sorry, almost a quarter of all ER visits for drowning and about one in five uh, boating deaths. Alcohol influences our judgment, um, balance, coordination, and out in the sun and heat, the effects of alcohol are heightened. And then finally, any underlying disorders, meaning any medical issues or problems that someone may already have. Uh, cardiac issues, someone's going to heart attacks, diabetes. Seizure disorders are a big one here. Drowning is the most common cause of unintentional injury and death. 
um, in this population with the bathtub being the biggest place where these people end up drowning. They have a seizure um, and go under and get into trouble. So moving forward, let's talk a little bit about then what happens, the process of drowning, understanding kind of what goes on um, with the physical struggle and then pathophysiologically what happens to someone when they drown. So mechanism of injury, someone gets into trouble in the water, whether it's they fall out of a the boat, they're swimming and cramp up, they get tired, the water's cold, and um, whatever reason goes on, it elicits the kind of panic response once someone gets into trouble. As that person starts to panic, they begin to uh, hold their breath, they may struggle, flail around, there's some air hunger there. As this happens, um, they have an increased inspiratory effort and then ultimately uh, some water kind of may get into their larynx and that airway just a little bit as they're struggling to remain on the surface, stay up. And as that happens, the larynx is going to spasm down. This is a way to close off the airway. It's meant to be a protective mechanism to prevent water from getting in. But unfortunately what happens is when water can't get in and neither can air. And so uh, the patient may grasp, uh, gasp again for air. The spasm will go down. Ultimately, uh, what happens with the person is they're not getting air in. Uh, they're going to lose consciousness because they can't breathe, and then they're going to sink and go under. That airway may relax. The spasm may relax, and then they may inhale more water, uh, contributing to further damage. Um, or that airway may become closed, and they just die from asphyxiation. Uh, interestingly enough, while commonly we kind of think of seeing someone drowning, they flail or scream for help or coughing, we expect to see most often in drowning incidents, um, people are seen kind of just floating motionless on the water or they go under and just don't come back up. We actually don't usually see a lot of real struggling on the surface. And if there is any struggling, it happens pretty quickly before um, someone goes under. The challenge with this is that it makes it really difficult for us to recognize when someone may be getting into trouble and often leads to delays in uh, rescue efforts. I used to work as a lifeguard out at the ocean, and I know frequently in rescues it was amazing how hard it was to detect um, when someone really was in trouble and how quickly someone would go down um, from the time you notice that they may be struggling. So I think something just to keep in mind. So the pathophysiology of drowning, what happens when someone drowns? So we kind of know the mechanism of injury, what goes on, that panic. So hypoxia, meaning lack of oxygen, is the biggest source of injury for these people. Talked about that laryngospasm, that clamping down of the airway to prevent water uh, getting in, uh, it's called aspiration of fluid. Um, when that happens, um, unfortunately, we don't get air in, and then there's no oxygen coming in. The red blood cells don't have any oxygen to pick up from the lungs. There's no oxygen being delivered to the rest of the body. Uh, when the heart doesn't get oxygen, um, then cells start to die, and people start to experience arrhythmias and may go into a cardiac arrest because of that lack of oxygen secondary to this hypoxia. Additionally, um, they can also get an aspiration or inhalation of water or fluid into the lungs. Fluid getting into the lungs, you have these little air sacs in the lungs, and that's where the exchange of oxygen takes place. That's where that oxygen goes right across those little air sacs into the little capillaries you can see there on my screen, and then <coughs> the blood gets oxygenated and is able to take that to the rest of the tissues and organs in the body. When fluid gets into there, it impairs the ability of those little alveoli to secrete surfactant. This is a special little substance that helps those little air sacs to stay open and keep them from sticking to each other, uh, which is really important. When those start to flap down, that impairs the ability of oxygen exchange to take place. What happens then is you get really stiff lungs that are non-compliant and they can't ventilate well. And so you get this vicious cycle of worsening uh, oxygenation. Uh, when the body isn't getting oxygen, it reverts to an anaerobic metabolism. And unfortunately, a byproduct is, of that is lactate, which is a really acidic substance. So our body gets really acidic as well. 
Um, and then, like I said before, leads to arrhythmias, irregular rhythms in the heart, and ultimately cardiac arrest for these people. Looking through the dis different systems of the body, what are some of the other uh, effects on the different systems in the lungs or pulmonary system, like I mentioned before, you get a loss of the secretion of surfactant and fluid gets into those little alveoli, so they collapse down, they don't stay open. That impedes our ability to exchange gas and make the the actual lung itself, stiff and non-compliant, hard to inflate that lung, it can also lead to some inflammation and swelling in the lungs, which further impedes uh, the ability to exchange gas. Uh, additionally, in someone who survives, they become at big risk for infection, uh, particularly if they swallow water that's got a lot of gunk and yucky substances in there that can really uh, gunk up those little alveoli and um, and and make it harder to exchange air, um, et cetera. Uh, cardiovascular with the heart, uh, primarily the problems there, there's no primary injury to the heart. The big injury comes from a lack of oxygen and the buildup of a lot of acidic products in the body that lead to arrhythmias. Uh, neurologically, meaning the brain, uh, we get impaired blood flow to the brain when uh, there's a lack of oxygen and in cardiac arrest. This leads to ischemia, death of our brain cells, um, and a lot of edema and swelling. So even in someone who survives, depending on how long they are down, or how long that resuscitative effort is, can really affect their overall neurologic function long term. So something just to keep in mind when we think about uh, survival from these injuries. Uh, renal or the kidneys typically don't suffer too many initial primary consequences. Same thing, the big thing is mostly secondary and it's not super common in drowning, but they can suffer from acute renal failure if they survive the initial incident. And that's mostly gonna be because of a lack of good blood flow uh, during like a cardiac arrest or impaired oxygenation um, because of the submersion accident. And then metabolic. Primarily, people initially suffer from a respiratory acidosis due to their inability to ventilate and oxygenate, and then that kind of converts to a metabolic acidosis. So high acidity, then the electrolyte changes, so this is like your magnesium, potassium, sodium levels, etc. There's usually not a lot of changes in these people, um, and if there's a significant influx of water enough to affect electrolyte change, usually these people are going to die um, anyway, so typically the people who survive some acidosis, but we don't see a lot of other big changes in their uh, metabolic status. <coughs> so treatment. Our number one priority for these people is rescue, getting them out of the water quickly. And we always want to remember to use our safe rescue techniques, kind of that old adage, uh, uh, reach, throw, row, go. So we always want to be uh, putting a rescuer into the water to be our last resort because anytime we're throwing someone else into the water, we're putting more people at risk. Um, and we need to be able to take into consideration, number one, I think the skill set of the rescuer is available. So when you're talking swift water rescue, if you don't have people skilled in swift water rescue, um, I think inappropriate to be asking someone to get into the water to affect a rescue because we're putting them at risk. Um, and consideration for any specialized equipment that we're gonna need to affect a safe rescue. Uh, so you're in the image throw bag, PFDs for our rescuers, helmets, um, a wetsuit depending on the conditions, or dry suit, et cetera. So looking at assessment and management once we get that victim out of the water, um, our primary objective are our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. For that first responder or person on scene initially, that's what we want to focus on. We want to initiate CPR as quickly as possible if it is needed. Final immobilization only if appropriate, so if someone dove into the water, didn't resurface, were suspicious of some spinal injury, or swift water rescue where you may have someone who tumbled out of a kayak or raft and banged around quite a bit by rocks or things in the river, uh, who there may be some consideration for other injuries that we'd be worried about. 
um, protection from aspiration. So more than 50% of individuals who experience a submersion incident are going to vomit when they come out of the water. Because while air is may, uh, fluid may go into the lungs, a lot may go down into the stomach as well. That stomach gets big and distended. These people are going to get sick and throw up, so we want to use caution. So if we can, turning that person onto the side, or if appropriate and you're trained and have the equipment and skill set there, even placing a gastric tube down into the stomach to drain uh, stomach contents to help minimize that risk for vomiting. Why do we worry about vomiting? Because we're worried about if someone vomits and getting some of that vomitus down into the lungs, which further impedes oxygen exchange and then also puts some big risk for infection when we get that kind of gunk down into the lungs. Another big important aspect, if you're first on scene or first responder being involved, getting a good history either from people around um, or who witnessed the event. So the mechanism of injury, how it happened, you know, did they dive into the water, they tumbled out of a raft, they fell off of a boat, they were swimming and went down. Uh, what the person's age is, how long they were under the water, um, how quickly uh, CPR was initiated if it was needed, what the temperature of the water is, the cleanliness of the water, did the person struggle at all before they went under or not, and um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the presence of any drugs or alcohol consumed by that individual, and then of course any underlying medical problems. <coughs> Why are these issues important? Um, because they can help affect prognosis and they can help further on down the road for uh, advanced healthcare professionals to kind of know what to expect um, for this patient and their care. So typically children fare better than adults. They have smaller body surfaces area, a uh, body surface area, excuse me, to cool. So meaning they uh, get into the water, they may become hypothermic more quickly. Cold can be protective for um, for individuals who suffer a submersion event. Um, obviously, submersion time, shorter duration, they're going to do better because uh, they're less risk for cellular damage because of hypoxia or lack of oxygen. The water temperature, temperatures below 70 degrees Fahrenheit are capable of inducing hypothermia. And like I mentioned before, you know that hypothermia can have a kind of protective effect. That's basically because uh, cools the body, lowers the metabolic needs, lowers oxygen needs of the body, and so hopefully preserves cells and cell function from death. Uh, struggling less, people who are struggling more, uh, fare, fare worse off when people who struggle less, and that's kind of because that last ditch effort, using a lot of muscles and activity to get a release of epinephrine, um, et cetera, and they're using up more oxygen, have more oxygen demand, metabolic needs increase. And so uh, they're not going to do as well as someone who kind of struggles less, has less energy production. They have a smaller deficit, basically, of their oxygen needs. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, cleanliness of water, contaminated water, bigger risk for infection and injury in these people. So let's go through just a couple different categories, too, um, of assessment and management of these kinds of people that you pull out. First, uh, let's talk about our victim that we pull out who maybe gets into trouble, but we're able to get them out of the water pretty quickly. You know, maybe they bob under for a second, but we're able to pull them up, or a bystander it is. Um, and they're largely asymptomatic. We get them to the surface, um, you know, obviously a little scared, et cetera, but they're awake, talking to us, breathing. And these people are management. We want to focus on um, maybe just giving them some oxygen support, maybe some EKG monitoring if we have that capability mostly to monitor for some potential arrhythmias that might occur. And these people we really ought to strongly encourage uh, transport to the ER for some initial observation. Uh, there may be a delay of onset of symptoms by as much as four to six hours um, from someone who suffers from a submersion event. So they go on the, under the water, they may inhale a little bit of fluid into the lungs, initially seem to be okay, but there's some injury to those alveoli, they may have some uh, big risk for infection, um, and uh, also those alveoli collapse, they can have impaired ventilation. So these people, it's really worth their while to just go and be monitored, monitored initially uh, just for a bit. Then our victims who go under, come out, they maybe don't need initial CPR, but are symptomatic, maybe having some difficulty with breathing, et cetera. These are people we really want to make sure are priority 
our priority for them is always airway management. Um, we want to make sure we're protecting that airway to ensure that they're getting adequate ventilation. The big problem, the big uh, number one reason people get injured in submersion accidents is hypoxia and acidosis, and we can correct that with good ventilation. So keep that airway open. We want to maybe consider giving them some oxygen. Another big thing, while hypothermia can be protective initially, once the victim is removed from the water, we really want to focus on further losses of body heat and uh, rewarming if needed. So, you know, putting warm blankets on these people, getting those wet clothes off, keeping them up off the cold ground, et cetera, all of those. Uh, considering an ID placement for people for either fluids or meds if uh, it may be needed, and EKG monitoring as well if we have those capabilities, and then for sure on someone who's symptomatic, they need to go to the ER for observation. If they do well in the ER and don't present with any further symptoms, they may end up being able to go home, but there's a good portion of these people that will end up needing admission for further monitoring and care. Then in, uh, kind of a subset of that is our people who go under. Um, we get out, but they're in cardiac arrest. For these, our priority is extrication. Um, there's sometimes some talk, uh, especially online, if you look and kind of use Google and search about doing CPR in the water, you know, on a firm board or things, but it just really hasn't been shown to be effective. So I think our priority is getting someone out of the water to a place where we can do CPR, whether that's onto our boat or to the shore as quickly as possible to initiate CPR. That's their best chance for survival opening up that airway and getting that heart started. Um, with rapid transport to the ER, the longer someone is down, the bigger risk they have for further complications, specifically neurologic injuries for these people. Um, positive pressure ventilation can be awesome for some of these people, so whether that's intubating, putting a breathing tube down, um, and bagging and then ventilating them uh, once they're to the hospital on a ventilator uh, with ventilatory support or CPAP, which is just some positive pressure. Why that's helpful is it's going to help pop open those little alveoli so that they can better oxygenate. Um, and then last category um, in management is recovery. How do we know when resuscitative efforts aren't worth it or when we should stop? So when we go to, you know, submersion incident and we get someone out of the water, uh, indications that maybe this is just a recovery and not a resuscitative effort. So someone we pull out who, uh, you know, warm water, the person's at a normal body temperature, but they've got some post-mortem lividity. What is that? That's that kind of blackish, bluish discoloration we see in people who passed away. Rigor mortis, the body is stiff. They've obviously been down for a long time. Or they have obvious injuries that are incompatible with life. Um, these may be indications that resuscitative efforts um, are not worthwhile and that this should just be a recovery mission. <coughs> Excuse me. If we spend more than 30 minutes on our rescue operations in warm water with the body still submerged this whole time, uh, we can be pretty certain that this is just going to be a recovery and not a resuscitation anymore. Um, of note, we need to continue with full resuscitative efforts if it's a victim submerged in cold water and they've been underwater for one hour or less. Um, we know, as I mentioned before, someone who's been immersed in water uh, less than about 70, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that there is a chance for successful resuscitation. The lowest recorded core temperature of a drowning patient who subsequently survived is, is 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And the longest case of submersion with subsequent survival is 66 minutes. Um, so there is a chance there. So there's that adage, not dead, so warm and dead. And that's something we need to keep in mind with our cold water submersion. Um, other thing, uh, lack of response to a resuscitative effort. So you're 30 minutes onshore doing CPR. We're not getting um, any kind of response, et cetera. At at that point in time, there may be some consideration to just calling this and recognizing that our efforts um, are, are in vain, unfortunately. So what factors affect prognosis then for these people when we get someone out? Rapid rescue. The quicker we get someone out, 
Uh, the better early CPR, the sooner we start those resuscitative efforts, the better their prognosis. Age, younger people fare better than older. Uh, body temperature, someone who was colder initially is going to fare better than someone who was submerged in warm water or normal body temperature. The amount of time they were under and the length of our resuscitation. So doing CPR, they had a long downtime, they're not going to fare as well. Um, favorable predictors for someone, so someone who's alert when we get to them, they've got a normal heart rhythm, reactive pupils, and maybe a little cold, even hypothermic, they're probably going to do just fine. Uh, things that are kind of our unfavorable predictors, someone who's been submerged for more than five minutes, or it takes more than 10 minutes from rescue to start a resuscitation, or uh, their initial blood pH is less than 7.1, so they're pretty acidic, meaning they've probably been down without oxygen for a while. They're not going to fare as well. And then those that we kind of put in the category less than 5% chance of recovery or survival, individuals who are comatose on arrival to the hospital, they have absent brainstem reflexes, unreactive pupils, uh, they were submerged for more than 10 minutes, or we have a resuscitative effort that lasted for more than 25 minutes. These people are likely not going to survive. So prevention. Uh, one of the saddest parts I mentioned before with drowning submersion incidents is that they're largely preventable. Um, so how do we prevent them? I think key is good public education for our people about how to be safe around water. Uh, you know, for parents, close supervision, keeping an eye on your kids, even in the presence of lifeguards, whether that be at the ocean or a lake where someone may be watching or a swimming pool, um, we still have a responsibility to be looking out for our kids and watching them and keeping them safe. Um, you know, if you have a personal swimming pool or things like that, making sure there are barriers barriers up around them, fences, locks on gates, so kids can't get into those areas unsupervised. Um, you know, we up our chances of being more safe swimming in areas where there is someone on duty to observe and watch when possible, and then life jackets, huge, huge, huge. Good PSD um, that's certified to be safe, uh, can't be stressed enough. Um, so many drownings occur unnecessarily because someone failed to wear a life jacket, particularly in those boating-related accidents. When you're out on the water, avoiding excessive alcohol use or other drugs that impede our judgment, coordination, and function uh, to keep us safe. Uh, CPR certification can be awesome, even for our lay people having some skills. So if someone does have an incident, uh, it diminishes that time between um, uh, when someone can get there to help with resuscitative efforts who is certified. Um, and for us, Swift Water Rescue Forces, you know, for those who are around Swift Water, for those of us on teams that uh, interact with Swift Water, the Swift Water Rescue Technician course is learning how to be safe in that rapid moving water and how to navigate and, uh, and move through that water to effect a, a safe rescue for these people. Um, in summary, I'd just like to emphasize that prevention really is key. Uh, rescue or safety always comes first in these incidents, so making sure that we are never compromising our own safety uh, to rescue someone else. And then remembering that airway management is critical. This is going to be the factor that's key in helping these people we get out. We want to prevent further injury and damage rapid extrication, getting them out of the water quickly, and starting that CPR, that early resuscitative effort, early on is going to improve chances for survival with minimal deficits long term. Um, I'd just like to, uh, before I open up to questions, just give credit to the CDC. Their website is awesome. And also to the Wilderness Medicine Society. They have some excellent resources. I reference Dr. Spessy Hawkins lecture on uh, submersion injuries as well, and I have references available upon request. Um, so all that being said, I'd like to open it up now for questions from anyone who may have them. OK. Thank you, Lindsay. And um, we do have a couple of questions now. Um, so if you have any that you haven't typed in already, you can um, go ahead and enter them uh, in the chat slash question section of your control panel. 
Um, so the first question is, um, they'd like to know if you would address secondary drowning or ARDS. Yeah, so secondary drowning, um, that kind of all comes down, that falls into that category of, um, you know, events that occur, it kind of fit with that near drowning, et cetera. So these are people who survive that initial event um, but have injury to the lungs from there. So they get at big risk, like I said, those alveoli are damaged from that water that comes in, it destroys the surfactant um, and puts them at big risk. So ARDS, for those who don't know, is adult respiratory distress syndrome. So this is a syndrome that can develop uh, later in people over time. Um, those lungs become non-compliant and they're not able to oxygenate and ventilate well. Um, and even with uh, administering oxygen, these people um, fail to be able to exchange that oxygen properly, so they need a lot of ventilatory support, uh, positive uh, pressure um, to help open up those lungs. Their lungs just become really stiff and non-compliant. So this is kind of a secondary injury that comes. I think just uh, that's where I emphasize the really need for people to go and be observed and watch, particularly those people that maybe were submerged for a little longer, symptomatic, big risk for this. ARDS is associated with a high mortality, um, and it's a difficult syndrome to treat once people um, develop it because it's just hard to deal with those, those stiff lungs and, and treat and manage them well. Um, and then antibiotics is needed uh, for someone who has aspirated uh, to help with infection and to combat that. Uh, other questions? I hope that answered it well. Not... Okay. Um, the next question is, is there a preferred O2 delivery device? Um, I don't think there's necessarily one. You know, like our asymptomatic people, um, if they're oxygenating well, maybe just a nasal cannula is appropriate and fine. For our people who are more symptomatic, um, especially if they're having any difficulties, a non-rebreather mask, um, just so we can deliver higher O2 content. But I think it really just depends on your patient, if you have the capability to monitor uh, their saturations and see how they're doing, kind of base it off of, off of that. But uh, I think looking at your patient really is what it comes down to. So what is deemed most appropriate given your patient condition. Okay, and um, kind of back on the secondary drowning topic, um, what about it, what about the subject of hyperventilation induced hypoxia? This is a significant medical, con medical concern for people engaged in prolonged breath holding activities to swim long distances or stay underwater for a prolonged period. Uh, sorry, repeat that one one more time. So the question is, what about the subject <laughs> yeah. of hyperventilation induced hypoxia? So um, this is a significant medical concern for people engaged in prolonged breath holding activities to swim long distances or stay under the water for a prolonged period. So big concern with that is shallow water blackout. So these people who hyperventilate to be able to hold their breath longer, um, it can be an effective method. Uh, you're blowing off your extra carbon dioxide. Your CO2 can be a drive to breathe for us. So the idea is you hyperventilate, blow off that extra CO2, so you diminish kind of that drive to breathe for a little bit longer so you can stay under longer. Unfortunately, there's a risk with that of uh, blacking out under the water when people hyperventilate. Um, you see it uh, in swimmers sometimes, uh, swimming pools of those distant swimmers. So um, I think just something that we need to exercise caution with, and if you're someone who's serving a safety, something for someone who is engaged in these activities, being aware to, um, to watch knowing what that person's capabilities typically are for how long they can stay under and knowing to intervene early and quickly for these people to pull them out. You know, as far as what happens after with hyperventilation, it's the same process as, as, as everyone else. They lose consciousness and then um, may aspirate or inhale fluid into the lungs and then the pathophysiology is the same across the board. Um, so in and of itself, it's not the worst thing in the world to do. It's a practice that's common, but there is that risk for, for blackout associated with it. But, um, other questions? OK. Um, how easily can symptoms of secondary drowning be observed immediately after the incident? Um, you know, sometimes I think if someone isn't initially symptomatic, um, 
you know, the literature out there says about four to six hours symptoms may begin to appear, and I think that mostly presents with some respiratory difficulties, usually some uh, decreased oxygen saturations, um, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, at home, say someone opts not to go in, says they're fine, you know, how soon would you know they're into trouble? It may not be until they're in more serious trouble. So you may notice things with difficulty breathing. Um, you know, in an ER or hospital, we can observe those subtle changes by watching uh, oxygen saturations, you know, steadily maybe declining or some little arrhythmias occurring or temperature increasing or really signs, um, you know, some uh, on blood work, maybe blood a little acidic or things like that. So um, subtle changes, you know, within four to six hours, if they're going to be symptomatic, I think we're going to see stuff pretty quickly. And the asymptomatic may be a little bit before you see something um, noticeable that would prompt you to go seek uh, further advanced care. Okay. Um, the next one is, are there any statistics on rescue behavior and drowning? That is the pu that is public who try to assist and becomes victims themselves. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are. I myself can't speak to those. Um, there are a couple of different resources out there um, available that you could look to on those. The American Red Cross has some research and literature out there on uh, rescue efforts as well as, uh, now I'll forget the organization, if you email that question, I can pull up, can't remember, but there are, there are some uh, organizations out there that have been doing research. I can't personally speak to those, but they may have some more statistics or numbers on those. Okay. Um, the next one is, are fingertip pulse ox, ox, the oximeters any value in evaluation of submersion patient? Uh, the big key would be um, perfusion. Do they have good blood flow? So someone who cold water submersion particularly, um, so those little fat monitors rely on you getting good flow, flow, particularly those ones on like the fingertips and things. So someone who's really cold has poor perfusion to those fingertips, their toes, wherever you're putting that monitor, probably not going to be a really reliable measure. On like a warm water, someone who we pull right out, uh, they, they can be a decent means of measurement, but um, those cold water is probably not going to be a very reliable uh, indicator. Okay, um, and that is all the questions that we have so far. So um, I am going to go ahead and switch it back to my screen and start wrapping it up. So if you okay. have any, um, if anyone else has any further questions, they can feel free to type them in, um, and then we'll get to them before the end. Otherwise, um, you can definitely email Lindsay. Um, so let me change it over to my screen. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen momentarily, and um, Lindsay's email address is at the top of the screen, so you can email her with further questions um, that you <laughs> can come across as you listen to this presentation again or think about it. Um, the MRA webinar series hosts webinars frequently, so you can keep an eye on the MRA and PMI websites for future dates and topics. Those URLs on your screen are also where the recording of the webinar and the presentation slides will be for you to access in the future. Uh, for news and updates, you can follow PMRA and PMI on Facebook and Twitter, and the links are shown on your screen. So that's where we'll post things about future webinars and then you know, just general news and updates about uh, both the organizations. So uh, we don't have any other questions, so um, thank you very much for everyone for watching it, and we hope that it was helpful.